to you, friends. Um, have you been seeing friends on Facebook post things they're thankful for each day in November? Have you seen that? I haven't seen it. I like it, but I haven't, I haven't been quite ready to commit to it. But uh, maybe next year. Uh, but I do want to say that I am thankful for this community, for 6-8, and our time together in worship and in service. It's something unique that we have. And I was at a Vitality event yesterday that reminded me about that, um, that, w- that we have this unique thing. Not that we're alone in having some really great things going on, but we do have some really great things going on. So thank you for being here and for being part of it. Will you pray with me? God of light and of darkness, God who is able to do far more than we can ask or imagine, fill our hearts with joy. Bless us with your goodness and lead us on into the future that only you know and hold faithfully. We pray in the name of the one who walked in our shoes, Jesus Christ. Amen. So both this week and last, we've been looking at writings from the prophets. Amos was last week's prophet, and he was writing during a time of oppression and injustice being perpetrated by Israel's own rulers. He was warning people to turn away from empty worship toward true justice. But this week, the emphasis is different. Terrible things are already happening. People are engulfed in the mighty darkness of war, of revenge and killing, in the cycle of destruction, grief, and loss. They face captivity and oppression. They face burdensome yokes, unfair treatment by their oppressors. And so Isaiah's message to these downtrodden people is one of hope. The people who have lived in darkness have seen a great light. The yoke of their burden is broken apart by God. They were captives and now they are free. And a new leader is coming, bringing with him a new era and a new way of life. There won't be any more war, but instead peace marked by justice, by fairness, by equity. So when I hear this passage, especially the section that starts naming this new leader, this child born to us, I immediately start thinking of it as a Christmas passage, right? And I even have a particular song from an Amy Grant Christmas CD that I have. Anyone else have Amy Grant? Anyway, and it goes, wonderful counselor. And they're actually pulling from Handel's Messiah, but it's on the Amy Grant CD. Anyway, so I hear my Christmas CD when I hear this um, Verse, And we talked about this in Bible study this week, about how beautiful and how comforting those images are for us as we think of them as attributes of God and as attributes of Jesus, uh, God among us. And as Jesus taught us about the kingdom of God, and as Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, he was describing the same realm that Isaiah imagines in our story. Like maybe Jesus didn't actually 100% invent the idea of the kingdom of God, right? Maybe he's pulling from tradition. A kingdom that Jesus described that's like a table where everyone is invited to sit and to eat their fill. A society where people are judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. An economy where the bottom line isn't a number, but an assessment. How did we love God and how did we love our neighbors this quarter? The quarterly report of love. Okay, Jesus came from a humble background, and his power was not the kind that we normally think of as power. But he inspired, and he started a movement, and he kindled a fire in people to build and to follow and become something more. And in his death and in his resurrection, he showed us that even death is not the last word, that God has the final word, that God is still speaking. But the people who first heard this passage didn't know about Jesus. They didn't know what was coming next year, much less in hundreds of years. What would it be like to live in the middle of things? They're really like, this passage is like in the middle of the Bible, right? What would it be like to be in the middle of the Bible like that, without getting to hear the end of the story? Of course, we live in the middle of things too. Even though Christians have pretty much stopped adding books to the Bible at this point, so we're not in the middle of the Bible. But I know there's this tradition that we have as Christians to think of ourselves as living in the end times. And that's a tradition that has lasted for a long time. And that the second coming of Jesus is right around the corner. And I do think that there is a good spiritual discipline, right? To stick with what you're doing in the day-to-day. It might not feel like it's, like it feels like you could do it later, but really you should be doing it 
every day. Because you never know what tomorrow could bring. You really don't. But in all reality, I believe, or at least I very much hope, that we are not the last generation to live on this earth. Sure, we're the latest one, and so it's easy to start thinking maybe this will be the last. But I think there is still some work to do, right? And like those Israelites living in the middle of the Bible, there is more to come. What if Isaiah lived today? What might he say to us? In the former days, the city of Baltimore experienced widespread decay and abandonment. The people lived with poverty, crime, and destruction from within. The darkness of racism divided people from each other and kept them from fighting the powers of oppression together. But the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. On Baltimore, light has shined. In the former days, drugs and addiction, alcoholism and abuse pulled people and families down deep into a dark ocean of sadness and grief. But the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. On Baltimore, light has shined. In the former days, abuse of the land, pollution in the air, chemicals in the water kept people sick and separated from God's good world. Our cars and our airplanes, our meat every day from faraway lands, our need for stuff, 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 crowded out the lightness of trusting in God's grace. But the people in the wa- who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. On Baltimore, light has shined. So it's a reimagining for today. Uh, with apologies. Baltimore includes the county and also Ellicott City. Howard County as well. Want to be inclusive here? Sorry about that. All right. But what would it look like to have the light shine on us? What does it look like to watch for and to cooperate with God's love breaking in? What is our chapter in this story going to look like? What would it look like to have the light shine on us in our 6-8 community? What would it be like to welcome and build relationships with an extended family of, say, 50 committed disciples, people who we can partner with to grow in our faith, people we can partner with to work for justice here in Baltimore, people we can partner with as we learn again and again what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves, each person a child of God, a word of love, taking action for justice, loving extravagantly, and walking humbly with God. What that would that mean for the kingdom of God? What would it look like to have the light of God shining on our work for justice? What would it look like to listen with respect to homeless people and speak out with conviction about the issues that they face? What would it look like to look racism in the eye, to see where it keeps us from loving our neighbor, and by God's grace, to learn to take another path? What would it look like for each of us to take our care for the earth to a new level? What would it be like to have the light of God shining on us as we walk humbly with God? Each of us encouraged and challenged to grow in our trust for God, learning and growing in what we believe and feeling free to express our doubts as well as our blessed assurances. What would it mean for us to make prayer a priority and to live with the conviction that God is still speaking in our daily lives? What would it look like to give our time and our money, our talents, in a sacrificial and meaningful way, and to feel both appreciated and empowered in the giving. My dream for 6-8 is that we would become a self-sustaining organization so that we can do the amazing ministry we've been called to and that we are doing already. That as we grow from baby church into toddler church, that we find ways to stand and to walk on our own. That our stewardship of resources would give us the ability to go a long, long way together. We have an opportunity today to make a commitment to this work for the coming year. So you should have a commitment card from your bulletin. If not, I can find you one. And an opportunity to say, here is where I feel God's pull. Here is where I'm answering the challenge. Here is where I'm committing again to that beautiful dream that God has of a new world, a new society marked by endless peace, sustained by justice, and made beautiful by communion with God and neighbor. So now is your chance. God is bringing the stream into reality. Will you be a part?